We don't have to just narrow the aperture, do what resonates today and kind of let life happen too and those opportunities to reveal themselves and then go for it. Welcome to the Food Grads Podcast, the podcast that takes you on a fascinating journey into the hearts and minds of the amazing people who work in the food, beverage, and agricultural industries. My name is Veronica, and I am a PhD candidate studying fat-based food emulsions. On this podcast, we share insights from professionals at all stages of their careers. Find out what they do, why they do it, and how they are changing the food world one day at a time. So no matter what your passion is, there's always something for everyone in food, and we'll help you find it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Food Grads Podcast. In today's episode, we are covering finding a career that matches your passions, cultivating innovation, navigating your career in an age of change, and the Canadian Food Innovation Network, CFIN. Our guest today is Michelle Brisebois, Senior Marketing Strategist and founder of Tetrix Consulting Limited. Tetrix has helped startups define marketing strategy, mid-sized companies boost their SEO through engaging in optimized content plans and have conducted research and discovery on digital transformation trends used by large international software companies. Michelle has launched products, brands, and campaigns across a wide variety of packaged goods and service industries. She is also a published writer and part-time marketing professor at Niagara College. Overall, she is a lover of technology, restaurants, retail, and people. Hello, Michelle. How are you doing today? I'm well, Veronica. How are you? I'm I'm doing it quite well. I'm trying to get over this cold, which is a little bit frustrating. One of those summer colds that just don't seem to go away. But we're here and hopefully this conversation will perk me up. (laughs) Yeah, well, we'll do our best. Well, thanks again for taking time to come on the show, and I'm really excited to talk to you. We've already had some great pre-discussions prior to recording this episode, and I think the best person who can introduce themselves is you yourself. So can you introduce yourself and tell us more about what you do? Sure thing. My name is Michelle Brisbois. I am the founder of a small Canadian corporation called Textrix Consulting Limited. And so I specialize in marketing strategy and I specialize in marketing strategy for the food and beverage industry and particularly around technology and how the two can come together. And I've got, you know, a bit of a weird background. I mean, I'm 60 years old now, so probably shouldn't say that in public, (laughs) but that's okay. And I majored in applied human nutrition at Guelph University. Always knew that food was a passion for me. Food, you know, has psychology, it has art, it has science, it has history. I mean, it's got everything. And so I started my career doing research and development, new product development for a small company called Magic Pantry Foods that's no longer around. And then my career took interesting paths through pharmaceuticals and into sales and then into marketing. I landed in marketing in my 30s, but it had that psychology piece that I loved about human nutrition and and then did a little stint into banking for four years and then came back to the food industry through the wine industry, working for Andrew Peller Limited for 11 years. And I split my time five years, first five years, I was doing the retail marketing for their private stores in the grocery stores. And then the last six years, I was a state manager, general manager of Trius Winery And left in 2016 and started teaching with the Canadian Food and Wine Institute, teaching marketing and data analytics, and now with the Beverage Business Management Program, and started my company. So here I am. Wow, that was a great summary of a lot of amazing roles that I know that we could easily just spend the whole hour just talking with little details between how you moved from role to role. But One of the things that you touched upon that I think is interesting is talking about how food is this all-encompassing, that it has the psychology, it has the the science, it has the production. I think that it's so fascinating that it's one of those sectors, too, that you can really start at one place and just take it a step at a time and you somehow end up in a place you never start thought you would ever start with. 100%. Yeah, I've heard a few times lately people say, 
oh, new grads aren't considering the food industry sexy. And I just want to fall off my chair when I hear that <laughs> because it's like, who doesn't like food? You know, it's and so, you know, if people don't start finding it sexy, we're all in trouble. We need a food industry, clearly. But it really does have it's where art and science and culture meet. I mean, when we immigrate to a new country, we bring our food with us. So it's it's really got it all going on. I I would be as bold as to say that anybody in this world, we could sit down and say, what are your skills? What are your passions? And it would apply in a really cool way to the food industry. Well, that's hope where this podcast is help, helping out those that are listening. But again, I wanted to you, you tried a lot of different roles and, you know, you ultimately, I mean, not ultimately, but you shifted more towards the marketing side. Was there anything that really drew you towards that area? Yeah, <laughs> it's, I mean, I knew in grade nine, I wanted to major in nutrition. My friends were thunderstruck because nobody knew what they wanted to do, but I had just developed this passion for food and nutrition. And I took an aptitude test in high school. And this is back in the 70s. And it came back and it said the top two were actress and lawyer. And I <laughs> said to the guidance counselor, I don't want to be either of those things. I want to be a nutritionist. And so I ignored it. And I, I went into the food industry. And then in my early 30s, I just, I my role, I was working in pharmaceuticals. It was becoming more technical. And I went for some career counseling and they did something called a strong in interest inventory. And what it does is it compares, it asks you about your interests and what lights you up. And then it compares you to people who are happy in their careers and says, you know, you index very high with people in these roles who have similar interests and passions and are happy in their roles. And what came back so I'm 33 at this time. First time I did it, I was 14 years old. Now I'm 33 years old. And he said that your top two things are actress and lawyer. Oh my <laughs> I said, what? I don't want to be, I still don't want to be either of those things. And he said, let's look at, let's open the aperture here. He, he's a really good career counselor. And he said, you also scored really high on culinary. And I said, well, that's good because he did major in nutrition and he said, what I see in that score is that you enjoy persuading people. And he hmm. said, you probably really love, say, having a career in marketing in a food company. And so he put that bug in my ear and it was like, and back then we didn't have the internet. So all jobs were in the newspaper. Lo and behold, there was a job for a product manager at a company called Rich Products which it's a huge U.S.-based company. They're headquartered in Buffalo and they had a, a, a Canadian division in Fort Erie. And so I ended up working there for five really happy years. You know, that's where I really combined my love of the food industry and marketing. And, and they make value-added bakery products and those sorts of things, pizza doughs and whatnot. So that's how I, I ended up in marketing. And, you know, I would highly recommend invest, you know, this, this, Thing I did was called the strong interest inventory. I think it's still around. You can find it on the internet, but it really gives you some clues as to how it's really about pulling together the different parts of yourself and finding how it all can combine into one role. Wow, that's wonderful. And it's funny. I don't know why I find it funny, but in terms of quizzes, actually, first of all, great great career counselor that they were aware of a job very specific and they said food marketer like yep. that's pretty impressive that they they knew that but also that i guess quizzes actually do have a place and i i guess you are a story of it takes some self reflection and sometimes as well out, outward reaching to maybe have someone else help you to find out what you you at that time didn't even know existed Exactly. It's that somebody that can show you how the results you've, you've obtained on this quiz to point you in the right direction, how they can kind of put the interpretation together. And as soon as he said, well, you scored high that you love the culinary arts, you scored high. I also scored high with HR people. And, you know, I reached back to that when it they came to me at Andrew Peller and said, you know, we've, you know, 
we would like to see someone with a retail marketing background run the winery, but the role is really 70% HR. You've got a large team, you know, 120 people at full Oof. season and there's lots going on. People are always being people. And, <laughs> and so, you know, as I thought we'll do, I really want to do this. I realized, well, that test I took way back when I was 33 said that I scored high in alignment with people in human resources who are happy in their roles. So a role that has some experiential marketing through the events and the things we did on property and HR, I would probably really enjoy. So highly recommend finding the right test and the right person, you know, easier said than done, but, you know, find someone that can really help you put those pieces together. And you can always reach back to it through your whole career as a way of saying, yeah, this will probably work for me. And I, you can take the risk. That's really interesting. Maybe I should check it out, see if I'm actually following in the path of what I, I have a more yeah. aptitude for. I'd be, I'd be curious because the more I do careers and I write career profiles for food grads and I've written over like a hundred jobs and I just keep going like, wow, I never even knew this existed, like a food patent attorney. And like that, you need to have a bachelor's degree in science and like it just, and, it amazes yeah, and me. be an attorney. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, there's, um, I think the key to success now, one of the best pieces of advice I got when I started my business was niche down. Mm. And that's where, you know, I had thought, oh, you know, I'll just be a digital marketer. And then it was, well, what do I know how to do? What do people know that I know how to do? And it was the food industry. Well, what if I'm a digital marketer for the food industry? And then it just kind of, naturally aligned with technology so yeah definitely figuring out anything that you do that you're good at and how it applies to the food industry can really be powerful because then you can write your own ticket that's true there's a automatically just by introducing the word food industry you can really niche down on on focusing on the skills because that's always been something that I've always thought too that uh, I was like if I stick with the food industry you know it's it really can give me a lot of focus and through all these conversations I realized you can move around and such and you can really apply if like you did you know you had the research and development side and I bet those skills have come in handy once in a while because you've seen that whole picture of of start to finish where a product does and I know that marketing works very hand in hand with R&D so I can see that also being a compliment. Well, you've you touched on exactly nice segue to what I was going to say about <laughs> that when I, you know, after I had the career counseling, because I had been a key account manager at a pharmaceutical company, and here's this marketing role at a food company. Now, this is 1995, so middle of a pretty serious recession, and they had the luxury of saying, well, we want to hire someone who's been a marketer at a food company. And the way I wormed my way into the role was to say, well, I see from the job description that this role has to essentially be the bridge between the key account managers and the R&D team. I've done both those things. So I'd be the perfect person to understand <laughs> what each of them are going through. <laughs> and there they kind go. of went, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you. It, it's really, you know, we, we have... I think we find great joy when we get more curious about ourselves and and don't take ourselves for granted in what we've done and what we've accomplished and more curious about how does that skill apply to where I want to go next? You know, how can I make it apply? How can I, what are the parallels? And, uh, you know, life really isn't quite as compartmentalized, I think, as we make it out to <laughs> Well, that also segues to where I wanted to talk about, because one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on the show is to talk about the future, so to say, of food innovation. Of course, you're very passionate about that topic, and I know that you are more involved with the Canadian Food Innovation Network. So yeah. I'd love to talk first what that is, and I'd love to just bridge this conversation of talking about innovation, talking about the future. But for now, let's just start. Can you tell me a little bit more about CFIN and how they're supporting Canada's innovation sector? Yeah, CFIN, yeah, CFIN, standing for Canadian Food Innovation Network, is this incredible hub of some, the some of the most talented people 
I've ever had the pleasure of collaborating with. And the focus is definitely around helping those innovators in the food industry get a leg up to put Canada on the map as being known for its food innovation. I mean, we're blessed in this country with so many acres and acres of land. And, you know, we are, you know, we supply the world. We're known for supplying the world with food. And we have some pretty strong chops in terms of technology. You know, we're we're nothing to sneeze at in that respect. So combining the two is what CFIN's all about and bringing those those elements together. And you know, there's just really exciting work right now being done in terms of evolving the Yodel platform. And Yodel doesn't stand for anything. It does like the it's not an acronym. <laughs> okay. It literally does what it says on the tin, which is you stand on the mountain and call for help. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but there's five research innovation directors, each one focused on a certain geography of Canada, but they also have complementary skills, startup, food science, technology, commercialization. And so they all tag team beautifully in addition to being experts in their own region regarding funding, regarding where you can find, you know, a bottling line or things like that. So it's a relatively new organization, a couple of years old, uh, but I would really recommend anyone listening to this podcast Go to, you know, type into Google Canadian Food Innovation Network or CFIN, and it's free to sign up to Yodel because what you'll see there is a community that's sharing research and, you know, anything that's new and, you know, really active source of information with more to come. And that's where I'm working with them on helping to evolve the platform so that it's really stoking innovation in the food industry in Canada. I really love that. And I love that you use the word community because I think that that's always a positive to have. I know that there's so many people trying to do so many different things. And if you try to go out and do it on your own, you won't get far. But if we can bring yeah. this network together to collaborate and like make our ideas stronger, I think if anyone's worked in research, for example, and they start to, when you go in on your own, you can end up you can end up very pigeon pigeonholing yourself into focusing on one area. But then through like a spark of conversation with someone, they'll go, "Oh, I know this," or "I know that person," or "Have you thought about doing this?" You just expand your world so much, and I can imagine having a platform would be very beneficial for many people. Oh, exactly. And especially for new grads, because, you know, if you want to kind of onboard quickly yourself as you're going out looking for where you're going to point your career, you'll be able to see the, you know, be a fly on the wall for the conversations, mm -hmm. see what's hot and new and something there may spark a passion or just be a great thing to highlight in an interview. In addition to connecting with people already in the industry and, you know, everyone's really generous in, in my experience when you're, you know, whether it's on LinkedIn or on Yodel, you reach out to someone and say, hey, I have a question. They're, people love to be asked their advice. You know, they'll typically <laughs> get back to you. So, you know, and if they don't, it's because they're really busy, not because they're, you know, yes. so yes. don't be afraid to to put yourself out there a bit. You know, one student of mine sent me an email at the end of semester and she said, you know, could, could we have a meeting? And we sat down and she said, you know, I want to have a career just like yours. And I remember thinking at the time, I'm not sure how I feel about my career at this moment. <laughs> you know, was in the, I was in the middle of transition and then starting my business and I felt like mm -hmm. I was a hot mess. And, but, you know, to this day, you know, we still collaborate on stuff. You know, I've been able to introduce her to opportunities to get volunteer work that gave her experience that, you know, she's been able to parlay. And, you know, she's been helpful for me in terms of the stuff she's learning on the job now. So by her, had she not sent that email and said, you know, I just really like some some of your time and your advice, you know, I think we both would have been the poorer for it. So don't mm -hmm. be afraid. Well, that also was making me think about just the idea of innovation because we, we we keep on throwing that word around today. We we, we say innovation. I mean, what is innovation? 
I mean, I think a lot of us think of it as just technology. Technology automatically means innovation, but I don't think that's necessarily the best definition. How how do you go about using that phrase? I've actually thought a lot about this. I think I might even have it on my website a little bit, but I believe that innovation is creativity manifest on the physical plane. Hmm. So okay. creativity is the idea, it's the concept, and innovation is actually implementing it in I a like new that. way. Yeah. Like and that. so, you know, I thought a lot about how does, you know, and, and I'll be honest, you know, where this struggle came from was in terms of me defining my business. And, and the marketing role is an interesting one because it's it tends to in some cultures fall into the oh you know you're the cloud shuffling airheads that you know put the pretty posters up and so there can be this dismissiveness sometimes that comes regarding the creative process and so you know i i started using the word innovation more to describe my services because it's less scary to the suits than it, than the word creativity. But I think they're <laughs> very much intertwined. And I think one, one is the spark and the other's the flame, if that makes sense. No, that's a really good way of thinking about it. And I'm just thinking about how maybe, maybe college programs are different or maybe it's the programs that I think of. But I feel like school, unfortunately, might not lend itself well to really help foster that creativity because you go to school, you take your standardized tests, you might do a group project, which maybe you get to show your creativity there. But it's a very structured way of looking at it. And I can imagine that I think I've heard this, that a lot of students also struggle a little bit when they graduate because they're not used to losing the embrace of a structure from school yeah. and then being open to that. And I, I guess maybe this is a left field question for you, but what would you say, like, how, how does a student even first demonstrate that they have creativity and too, like, where do they even go to even start promoting this innovation mindset if they maybe don't necessarily want to be an entrepreneur, but maybe they do, I don't know. Like, like how, how do students start to stoke the flame? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, and that's a great question. I, one of the projects I did, because I don't always do projects for the food industry, it was for the District School Board of Niagara here, and they wanted help in raising awareness for their arts programs because what they found is in grade nine everyone had to take an arts credit and they they this particular school was in an area an affluent area and everybody wanted their kid to be a doctor or a lawyer <laughs> so all the parents were saying like drop the arts credit after grade nine you you know fulfilled your <laughs> mandatory requirement and take an extra math and so again the this is a traditional sort of and it's another thing that really you know gets my frost my cookies as my friend used to say is you know the this diminishing of the creative process as something that's lesser than or you know the, this is where we get the term the starving artist and so in doing research to come up with a strategy for that project there is you know you we've all heard of stem science tech technology, engineering, math, but it's really about STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So, you know, I, when you look at, again, it goes back to our earlier conversation with transferable skills. So, you know, think about the things you have to do if you're creating a painting, you know, you have to, you know, space, you effective use of the space time management you know there's and you could go on and on and on you know never mind the color theory bringing a creative concept into physical manifestation all of those things so to answer your question you know i think i agree with you 100 percent that we school tends to be in the business of giving people what they think they want and what to go out and get jobs and we as a society still treat the creative process like something that we we don't 
we recognize we need it, but it's always a little bit, you know, ridiculed. And so we we need to look at it in terms of steam and how arts is part of that balanced diet Mm -hmm. to expand other ways of thinking that allow you then to come back to a problem and see the solution that you didn't see before. So I would say to all students, typically all of us, you know, I occasionally meet people that will say, oh, I'm not creative. And then I'll I'll turn around and said, somebody who reported to me, she kept saying, I'm not creative. And I would say, yeah, you just totally revamp the scheduling system for the team. Like that's creativity. It creativity isn't always about a painting or, you know, something classically creative. Creative thinking is about saying, what am I missing here? What if? Or, you know, reaching out and saying to someone, can we go go for a glass of wine and kick this around and think of a new way of doing it? It's being open to the ahas that drop in and, you know, seeing something and figuring out how it might apply to something else, making connections. That's really what creativity is, is the ability to connect disparate things together. I did not think that that answer was going to go there, but I like it. (laughs) I like it. And I love how, thank you for closing it with like a good tangible example, because it reminds me, I was just listening to a podcast this morning about the art of thinking. What you're saying reminds me that they they were arguing that we, in today's society, we don't spend enough time thinking, just good, hard thinking, like just taking a walk and thinking about problems and all that. And it almost feels like that goes hand in hand with what you were saying with creativity is about thinking about new ways to to see something. Yeah, I mean, I'm one of my personal practices because I, I actually have grown to really the, the more I got made fun of in, you know, the in literally I was in one meeting in banking where a colleague described, you know, in front of everyone, she said, and then Michelle flits about and puts up the posters. And I actually had just finished that morning writing a huge recommendation for a deposit campaign. This is when I was in ba- banking in particular. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel honored the creative process. But in what it instead of me feeling bad about it, it made me double down on protecting it. So I recommend the books The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. It's a oldie but a goodie. And then one of the things she talks about, two things, one you've touched on, which is the walk, going for walks without, I'm bad this way. I like to listen to podcasts while I walk, but just walking without any distraction, listening to the birds, letting your mind go. And the other thing that she recommends that I started doing three years ago is something called the morning pages, where you write three pages in your journal, garbage. You can talk about what you had for lunch. You can talk about the fact you're mad at your roommate. You can talk (laughs) about whatever because you're not to read it again. You're not, you can rip it up and throw it out afterwards. It's not there for you to go back to, but you get it all out on the page and it's just like stream of consciousness. You do it first thing before you do anything else. And the theory is it clears away the psychic clutter to let the creativity flow. And the first time I did it, my first entry was because the author's Julia Cameron actually wrote a letter to Julia Cameron saying why I thought this was such a stupid idea. I didn't want to do it because I didn't know what else to write. And so and then I did it again the next day. And then by day three, I was in the zone. And it's just been a huge release over the years in terms of allowing that to flow. I've actually done it myself, not in the same capacity in the morning. I I feel like I'm fresh, like straight away. It's as the day winds on, that's when my mind gets a little bit jumbled. So I like to do, I've done it in the afternoon and such. And you're right. It's just this like cleansing. And then if you hate it, you know, you can just throw it away, but you'll never know. There might be like a nugget of something that you forgot that all of a sudden just something that just pops up and it just feels good, honestly. Like even if you don't get a creative idea from it, it's just clears your mind it's nice yeah she she really is seeing it as just the the garbage pail that we put all the crap that's in our (laughs) that's bugging us in to allow creativity to flow I believe her background I think she was a a a script writer in Hollywood that was her creative so 
So, yeah, I would, you know, again, the artist way, it's a great, there's a workbook that goes with it. And, uh, and so she's written a few books, but when it comes to creativity, that's a good one. Awesome. I'll, I'll make sure to actually link that in the show notes to make it easier for others to find, but I want to move the conversation back a little bit more to the future of the innovate. We would talk about what innovation is, how to cultivate that creativity, but I feel like we haven't talked about the future more so. And yeah. you mentioned it very early on that the food industry is not seen as sexy. And I wanted to know your thoughts on some of the places where you can see it's headed, because I think a lot of people are, there's a very shift, I think, in in society in terms of like how we're viewing work, how we're viewing the future with automation becoming like I, you just hear about that everywhere today. Like you can't get it go a day without hearing about it. And I think a lot of individuals might be scared, especially young graduates who might feel as though their degree might be useless or they don't know what to do with it. I wanted to get your thoughts on where you think where you think students can fall. Like, should they be worried about automation, AI taking jobs? Um, I know maybe some people are even worried about AI taking copywriting jobs or taking marketing jobs, but where do you see the future being in terms of these types of spaces? Yeah, I, I'm going to touch quickly on something that would be a great resource. I just listened to a fabulous episode of a podcast put out by NPR called Planet Money. And they these were mid-May. They did a couple of podcasts about AI taking jobs. And what they did as an experiment was they had the AI write the podcast, including the questions they were asking their guest. And the <laughs> guest was an expert on employment trends and AI. They did not tell the guest they did this and they were very nervous. So you got to listen to the episode because mm -hmm. the guest kept saying to them, wow, that's a great question. Another great question. But your question. And at the end, he said to them, you guys don't have to worry about your jobs because the questions you created for this one guy, you know, and then they had to tell the guest, OK, well, those questions actually were written by the AI. Oh my God. You know, it's happened before in history. Again, they touch on it that, you know, if we go back in time to before the phone companies had figured out how the technology to connect a call directly you had to go through an operator and those jobs were taken by gazillions of young women you know at the turn of the century who would sit at the phone company and connect you to the person you were calling and then the technology jumped that bridge and it was a huge loss of employment for a whole cohort you know it, it's flew under the radar because it was young females, you know, in the 1920s and 30s. But, you know, essentially, so we've been here, you know, there used to be people that would light the street lamps at night, and then we invented the light bulb. So, well, you know, m my advice would be don't get hung up and feeling discouraged that AI is going to take a job. It's going to create probably more opportunities then it will destroy. Goes back to my point about creativity. What do we have to offer? Being human. <laughs> you know, like that's mm -hmm. ultimately something a, a robot can't do. It may be able to do lots of other things, but we need to embrace our humanness. And so in terms of the hard skills, definitely data analytics. You know, one of the things I'd said to Niagara College, you know, we were looking at how to revamp the programs with some advisory committee meetings. And so they added a data analytics course that I'm lucky enough to be able to, you know, I help design and teach. And it's really about critical thinking and looking at the data and making, knowing the story the data is telling. So take a course on data analytics, or even if you don't have time to take a course, read a few articles, listen to some podcasts, you know, just to understand mm -hmm. how it works again in terms of innovation, creativity, and strategy. So, you know, there's a job emerging called chatbot trainer. So these robots have to be trained. And so, you know, there's all kinds of things that are going to evolve. So I would say, you know, the skills, the hard skills include strategic thinking, critical thinking, data analytics, or, you know, all the classics, organizational skills. And 
you know, to go back to your point about the food, you know, food industry not being appealing, part of the challenge that the industry has is that many of the jobs punch above their weight in terms of the hours you got to put in, you know, and I'm talking about things like farming, things like hospitality. And so the hours are unusual, often long. And we are, you know, at a time in history right now where people are quiet quitting and saying, you know, yeah, I'm not signing up for 60 hours a week. I want to do my nine to five Monday to Friday. And that's, that's a challenge for the industry. So, you know, my advice, like the old saying goes, you know, do something you love. You'll never work a day in your life because it doesn't feel like work. So, you know, you don't, you aren't sitting there saying, oh, you know, I've put in 60 hours. You're saying, I just spent the week doing something I love. So those are, you know, a few of the things that I would see as far as the, you know, we're in uncharted ter- territory. So future right. predicting is a little, little tricky, but, you know, we don't need people to crunch the data. We need people to understand which data is important and how it w- will inform decision-making going forward. Well. <laughs> it's a little scary hearing about I, I I do actually it's funny that you bring up the phone operators because for some reason that's always the first one that I think about like the little things that you don't realize I I was even in the train this morning and I, I was like no one uses how many people have actual GPSs in their car you yeah. know everyone used to use a Jeep everyone first of all just that little transitionary period between cars to having GPSs in your car which was crazy to now just using your phone yeah. Your phone has amazing capabilities and softwares and there's always jobs being created. But I think with me, I always struggle. I know you can't do future predicting, but it's hard to, and, and jobs will come and go. But one of the things I'm always thinking about is like, what, how, how do you focus on developing yourself to be able to transition to another role? So you mentioned about data analytics. Well, there's a lot of different choices you could choose for data, but I guess it's like, how do you choose if it's good to start an endeavor to start learning these skills, so to say? That's that's something I've been considering a lot. Yeah. And so again, I go, you know, if you asked yourself the question, you know, if I could go back to my my younger self, (laughs) what would I (laughs) what would I say, you know, to knowing what I know now? And, you know, I would say we tend to get too far ahead of ourselves. Like we want to map everything out. You know, I want to have my career mapped out. And I think that what I've learned is that the secret is to just take the next logical step and to leave a room in your life for surprises, for that chance meeting, for that, you know, when I was looking at rebooting my career after I left the winery. It was a former editor of mine because I've I've done some freelance writing with Canadian Pizza Magazine, Canadian Vending Magazine. And he mentioned in one of our little messaging on LinkedIn that he was taking this digital marketing course at McMaster and it's all remote and it's a, you know, kind of you can do it part time. And so, you know, that kind of fell into my lap. And I said, well, you know, I while I'm figuring it out, I'm just going to take this course and. And that was just the next logical step that then led to the next and the next and the next. And so instead of thinking about where do I want to be in 10 steps, what's the next logical step? What interests me now? And, you know, look for people that are doing that already and interview. People are a great resource. Like, hey, I'm thinking that what you're doing might be what I want to do. Can I talk to you about it? What do you like? What do you don't like? What would you, you know, if you could tell me to get one skill, what would it be? And, you know, just, you you see someone that's living the life you want. Don't get jealous. Find out how they did it. (laughs) I like that. I'm going to steal that quote. (laughs) I I think it's, it's, it's nice that you say that. And I think that it is something to hear that's good because it's comforting because maybe it is related to how we are taught as kids. What do you want to be when you grow up? And when yeah. you you mentioned about lawyers and doctors, you don't just become a doctor. Like you, you like you don't just say tomorrow, well, I'm going to become a doctor. You have to go through school and then you have to do your hours, which 
yes, you should. It's it's a career that's important that you have the background. But a lot of, you know, I feel like we're expected because we yep. we feel like there's this big leeway in all that. But maybe things are a bit more flexible than people realize in terms oh, of the careers. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And you know, if if somebody had said, "Here's your career," you know, like showing me a movie when I was eighteen, I would have said, "Nah." <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> what, am I going to run a winery in my fifties? No, you know. And so, yet that's where I landed. And you know, there've been so many times through my career where, where there was a certain path, a certain job that I knew was for me, and I'd be banging on that door like crazy, and it wouldn't be opening, and then the door right next to it, the one I didn't think was for me, would swing wide open. And, it, you know, I would almost get sucked into it, almost as though I, you know, it was just meant to be. And so always, you know, it's, you know, it sounds like uh, everything our grandmothers told us, you know, one door opens, another closes. <laughs> yeah. Or one door closes, another opens. You know, I think it's really your path. It reveals itself one step at a time. And, you know, if you just kind of inch your way and try not, I think this is where a lot of our struggles with mental health come from. Like we're looking at everything and trying to cope with it all. We don't have to just narrow the aperture, do what resonates today and kind of let life happen too. And those opportunities to reveal themselves and then go for it. And if it's not the right path, like, you know, there, you know, there have been paths I've taken that definitely weren't meant for me long term. They might have even been really, really difficult. I don't regret one of them because I always walked away stronger and better and, you know, and have learned things, met great people and learned things about myself. So you really can't get it wrong. I think that also shows that it's always good to have self-reflection on yourself. And I think you mentioned mental health. And I think with social media, although it can be a great tool, you know, if you go on and use Yodel, even I guess it's kind of like it wouldn't be social media, but it's an online platform and it can bring people together. But when you get so inundated with so many different opinions and such, it can make you self-conscious and feel like you're missing out on something. And, you know, if you just bring your world in a little bit, you don't have to solve everything. You don't have to be everything. Just find what, you know, work on yourself little by little. And if you reflect on yourself, it can be less overwhelming too if you're trying to be everything else. Yeah, never compare your behind the scenes mess with someone else's highlight reel. And, you know, just what you said was exactly the way it works is that, you know, it's just about, you know, inching your way and, you know, life is meant to be a marathon, not a sprint. So I think your generation for sure has had to deal with getting pigeonholed at a much younger age than my generation was. I mean, we're, we were still, you know, people joke about the 70s parents, like our parents, mine weren't. But, you know, the stereotypical was like sitting in their bathroom, sipping martinis while their kids were <laughs> playing on the highway. You know, like we were really not bust over that much and it was kind of like oh you'll be okay you know in some cases it's like I, maybe so and so could have used a little more you know support <laughs> but they kind of just turned us you know and and we are the largest cohort in history so the competition for jobs was horrid and you know you constantly were get losing your job because they would downsize because they knew they could find a whole bunch more baby boomers when the time came and so, you know, a much more volatile work experience, you know, with, you know, it's depending on where you land in the baby boom and I'm at the tail end. But the one thing we didn't have to contend with was this someone leaning over us when we're like 13 years old saying, do you want to go to university or college? You know, what do you want to do? And that's BS, quite frankly, you know, it's uh, like uh, we we got to stop that because I can assure you, you know, I know tons of people who are in the 50s and 60s who still don't know what they want to be when they grow up. So, oh, you know, like, you know, and so if if you're looking around <laughs> thinking everybody else has it figured out, I can assure you they do not. <laughs> do not worry. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> 
Well, I think that's actually a good place to stop there, Michelle. I, I think I want to end on that positive comfort, comfort note to know that not even the people like looking at you, I'm like, she's so successful. Look at all she's done. <laughs> she's had this career and all these types of things that, you know, you can reinvent yourself. You don't need to know 10 years into the future. If you want to be a doctor, okay, maybe you do need to know 10 years. But for a lot of the other places in the sector, at least food, there's something for everyone. And I think that you've highlighted that the the space is going to change, but no one can predict where it's going to go. And really just looking at the next steps is really what you need to do. Yeah. And it's, it is a great industry to focus on because we always need food. So, sure. you know, security is, is pretty good. If I can put a plug in for the good old food industry and, and leave it at that. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for coming on the show. I really enjoyed this conversation and I'm excited to also share uh, Stephen's uh, platform with everyone. I think that's going to be yeah, please, really great. Everybody join. Yes, we want new blood. We want the students and the emerging talent. So, you know, it do, you know, connect to me on LinkedIn, on Yodel. I love to connect with people and just put in a note saying you heard the podcast and all good. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Yeah. Thank you, Veronica. Take care. Thank you everyone so much for listening to episode 73 of the Food Grads podcast. All the notes to this podcast can be found by clicking on the Food Grads website and clicking on the student and grads tab. If you are listening to this podcast on Spotify, now you can directly interact with us. Spotify has just introduced a feature where you can respond to question and answers about each podcast episode. I have included it in all of our podcast episodes. So drop a hi if you're listening. If you are on another podcast service, then I am sorry they don't have this feature, but that doesn't mean that you can't reach us. Reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. I swear I'll get the message somehow. And hopefully Apple rolls out this feature out in the future. Innovation. It's become a bit of a buzzword and it has become synonymous with technology. Eh? You don't use the word creative, but use the word innovative because it just has a different meaning to it. It's funny how we're in this age of instantaneous communication. I mean, you can pretty much contact anyone at any time. And at the same time, it's made us feel even more disconnected. I don't know how that works, and I'm not going to try to figure it out. But instead of focusing on the scary aspects of the future, maybe if we just focus on collaborating with each other, that's the true way of going about. I mean, the future is uncertain. And like Michelle had said, the best thing you can really do is just focus on what's in front of you in the next few steps. Whether it's focusing on doing really well in your courses, networking like crazy, and just getting good at what you do now, that's really all you can do. It's just about trying so your next few steps will appear to you. Just focus on the things you're sure, then go from there. You know, when I'm worried about the future, I know this is going to sound so cheesy, but sometimes it gives me a little bit of comfort when I think, Instead of thinking about how scary the future can be because it's so uncertain, I sometimes like to tell myself that my future is so bright, I can't even see it. So, I'm sure that yours is too. Anyways, that's it for this week's episode. Thank you everyone so much for listening, and I will see you next time.